Uh, I'm Kiran Menugabal. I'm here to present a joint work with Professor Matt Valenti of West Virginia University and Dr. Robert Heath from UT Austin. The central idea of this work is about what we call the wearable communication networks. This is nothing but the network formed by multiple devices attached in and around the human body. So what we see these days is that there is a growing popularity for gadgets like Fitbits, smart watches, smart glasses, etc. So what we envision is that they form a network um, around the human body, which we call the wearable networks, and its popularity is going to go grow in the coming years. So this network can include um, low-rate devices like the fitness monitors, the Fitbits, etc., and also the high-end, high-rate, high-data-rate infotainment devices. So the Google Glasses would fit into that category. So this is interesting as well as challenging because when you look at it, if there are several users that are using such networks and if they are um, located in a dense and crowded environment, say like uh, in a finite area, like inside a train car or a bus, so how can you manage and ensure that you get good high data rates? So that's challenging. Now, millimeter wave is gaining popularity, and we propose, we imagine that this could offer a good solution for the wearable networks use case. That is because the millimeter wave has high bandwidths, so typically that would be like three or four gigahertz, that's worldwide for operation. And also it offers reasonable isolation. So what this means is that uh, the signal doesn't propagate well through the human bodies and through objects. So maybe I can use my devices, my network, operate my network, but then it doesn't propagate well enough to cause interference to other users that are also using the same channel and frequency. So we can get good isol reasonable isolation using millimeter wave. Further, instead of radiating power in all directions, as we do using an omnidirectional antenna, we could concentrate. You can beamform the transmissions using uh, compact antenna arrays that are very small. I mean, the fabrication uh, results in really tiny antenna patch arrays. There are also com commercially available products uh, pertaining to the 11AD and the wireless HD standards. So millimeter wave is a good candidate to serve the wearable networks that we are discussing here. Now, what we are looking at here is the kind of interference that is caused at the reference receiver. So similar work has been attempted before, mostly for cellular networks, where um, the tool of stochastic geometry has been used extensively, wherein you model the, uh, the nodes. There will be an infinite number of nodes spread over an infinite um, area in the Euclidean plane, and you characterize the interference cost at a reference receiver. Interestingly, they don't consider the effect of blockages there because microwave, as you know, isn't blocked well by buildings or human bodies. Further, there has been studies on uh, finite ad hoc networks uh, in a recent work, but that doesn't consider blockage or directional antennas there. Cell blockage has been considered for millimeter wave, that's for uh, the cellular system, wherein your own body um, acts as a blockage for the signal from your user equipment to the base station. Okay, what is different from this prior work when we bring it to the millimeter wave variable networks is the following. First of all, there would be a finite number of interferers, and the network region that we consider would be finite dimensional. So this would be a realistic assumption for indoor uh, wearable operation setting. Also, the location of these uh, interferers, I mean, basically the users who are um, on, onto whom these devices are attached, could be fixed or random. So fixed would be the cases when people are seated inside a train car, and random could be when people are standing and like moving around, etc. 
Also, in this work, we are modeling the blockages caused by the other human bodies. That means that how does the signal reaching from a user C get blocked by a user B, and you, are, you I mean, from reaching you, you are user A. So basically, what this means is that both interferer and the blockages are associated with a user. So you could be carrying a device that's causing the interference to the reference user, but then you can also potentially block signals coming from some other users. So that is exactly what we model in our work. To elaborate, uh, we model interferers as also the potential blockages because millimeter wave acts that way. We then analyze the uh, SINR distribution and the achievable data rate, uh, assuming that the millimeter network is finite sized and also conditioned on the fixed location of the interferer. So we assume the location of the interferers is known and then evaluate this uh, SINR distribution. And then we assess the impact of antenna parameters because antenna parameters are going to play a big role in millimeter systems as they are envisioned to give uh, higher gains and also uh, to give pointer and director um, communication. Well, so for the system model, uh, let's first model talk about the antenna model that we're using. We assume the antenna model has a 2D um, sectorized pattern in the uh, plane of relevance. What this means is that we can characterize the antenna array gain in terms of three parameters, that is the main lobe, uh, which has a width of theta, within which the gain seen is capital G, and outside which the cap, uh, gain seen is little g, that's the side lobe gain. Also, we model this in terms of a uh, uniform planar square array, which would be our typical patch antennas, wherein you have the, uh, there are total n elements here, and depending on n, you can adjust capital G, theta, and little g. So if you have a larger antenna, uh, larger number of antenna elements, you basically get a narrower beam and more uh, gain over the main lobe. Also, the omnidirectional case in which you have just one antenna element, is a special case here wherein n is equal to one, and we will get the beam width as basically the entire 360 degrees, and gains is gains are unity for both the side lobe and main lobe. So, so that is of interest, especially for um, low-cost variables. Now, the network to topology that we are considering here is with reference to the um, a typical receiver. So we call this the reference receiver that's indicated in green hole over here. And the location of all the interferers that are marked xi here are uh, the locations are defined in terms of the distance from the reference user and the uh, azimuth uh, angle phi i relative to the reference user. So this is the coordinate system that we assume. And the reference transmitter, I mean, that's also present on the reference user, is indicated as the red dot here. So in total, we have k plus 1 users, so k interferers, and one reference user within this finite dimensional, finite area network, uh, finite region. So we can uniquely define the location based on this coordinate system. Okay, to model the human body blockages, um, we look at the picture when, the, from the, we look at the, look at the top view of the network. So this is how it would look. So we model these as the human users. So these are modeled as circles here of diameter W. And this diameter W circle has these transmitters uh, XI with them. So what this means is that uh, with reference to the reference receiver, we say a ref uh, transmitter XI, the interferer XI is blocked 
whenever it falls in the shadow region of one of these circles. So basically we are modeling the uh, whether or not the line of sight from the interferer to the uh, reference user is blocked by another user or not. Additionally, we assume that the body of user i, that is yi, is not blocked, is not blocking the interferer xi associated with that user. Okay. The signal model, uh, likewise, we assume the wireless links are having a Nakagami fading with parameter mi. And depending on whether the link is line of sight or non-line of sight, we um, adjust the Nakagami parameter. So we have mn if it's non-line of sight and ml if it is line of sight. The path loss model likewise has two uh, values for the path loss exponent, alpha l if it is line of sight from the interferer and alpha n if it is non-line of sight. And we assume this directionality for the reference receiver. So depending on whether the reference, uh, whether the interferer xi falls within the main lobe of this reference receiver, uh, we have a gain of big GR. And if it's outside the reference receiver main lobe, it has a uh, gain of small GR. So this is the uh, effective normalized received power uh, from the interference at the reference receiver. As for this uh, reference signal, we assume the link is line of sight. So ideally that would mean that you had to, uh, in the initial phase, you have to beam steer and make sure that the two beams from the transmitter and the receiver of the reference user are aligned. And we assume the separation between the two, the reference receiver and the reference transmitter uh, is uh, R0. And the corresponding uh, part loss exponent is alpha naught, and the small scale fading is Nakagami with parameter M0. Now, the, with reference to the reference receiver, the interferers could be pointing their beam in a random direction. So we are not assuming any coordination uh, between the interferers or I mean in the network. So, that, so the antenna gain from the transmitter could be random. So that would depend on whether its main, the interferers main lobe is pointed towards the receiver or not. So since the receiver doesn't know about it, it's random with probability theta t by 2 pi. And also we assume that the transmitter uh, transmits with a probability PT. That would be like an aloha like medium access. So each transmitter, um, the, trans the power rel relative radiated power from the transmitter could be zero with some probability. It could be uh, having a gain of capital GT with some probability and a sm little small GT <coughs> otherwise. Okay, so with this we can define the instantaneous SINR that we observe at the reference receiver. So that would have the reference, um, the signal power here. And this is the noise power normalized by the transmit powers of the, device, the, of the reference user. And the K interfering terms, interferer terms in the denominator here. So the, idea, the, the next steps would be like we would compute the distribution of the SINR. So we would compute the cumulative, C the complementary CDF. And then using the distribution of SINR, we would derive the um, ergodic spectral efficiency and that's how we characterize the system. Okay, so some calculations based on that. So uh, the calculation is for the, for a given uh, omega. This omega set basically defines uh, the locations of the interferers. So what this means is that uh, relative to the reference receiver, given that, given you know the, uh, where these interferers are located, we can also like from that, impl I mean, compute whether it's blocked or not. So given their locations, what is the uh, complementary CDF, which is also called the SINR coverage probability. Coverage because it's the probability that the SINR is greater than some uh, threshold beta. 
So, this is what is computed and with some uh, mathematical steps we end up with this big expression here which may not be that intuitive but we have this basically. So, this, this is a multinomial sum which, uh, whose, which needs to be pre-computed and its complexity depends on the fade gain, the, the Nakagami fading parameter M0 of the reference link. So, assuming we know these parameters, we can pre-compute these uh, coefficients and then compute the um, SINR coverage probability. Okay. So, some numerical results. So, as we assume, we, kn we assume that we know the location of the interference. So, this, these are two scenarios that we are interested in. One, uh, this could ideally model um, a user's, uh, the performance experience by the user when he's seated in a, when he's seated in a, a train car. So, suppose the reference receiver, the reference user is sit seated in the center of the train car and there are, there are uh, interferers around him in these grid locations. So, that is one case that we are considering, that is when the receiver is at the center. The other one is the case when the receiver is at a corner. So, these are interesting because um, intuitively the center location would be the worst in terms of the interference and the corner location could be somewhat a better location. So, we want to see how much different are the two in terms of the parameters that we defined earlier. So, we also assume that all the nodes transmit with uh, the same power PI. So, and the parameters that we used for the system are these. So, first of all, we look at uh, how the performance varies based on the aloha transmission probability PT. So, PT is the probability that an interferer transmits. So, what we see is that if uh, we increase the aloha transmission probability of transmission, the curves actually move to the left, which means that the SINR coverage is poorer when the transmission probability is higher. Uh, this is the case when the user, the reference receiver is at the center and when all the users are having omnidirectional transmitters and receivers. Also, we see a similar trend for other uh, antenna configurations and also at other locations. Next, we move on and look at how the performance varies if we increase the directionality of the transmissions. So, basically, we just have to increase the values of NT and NR. Those are the number of transmit antennas and the receive antennas. So, as we had seen, increasing the number of antennas increases the main lobe gain but then decreases the beam width. And what we see is that having larger antennas would actually result in better performance because though the transmissions, uh, the interferers may point you with high power, the probability that such an event occurs is smaller. So, eventually what we see is uh, the performance improves with <coughs> more uh, antenna elements. Further, we are assumed that the reference link is in a way uh, correctly pointed. So, the more antennas you have, the better the signal link and the probability that the interferer link is bad is smaller. Yeah. So, this is again for the result for uh, the case when the receiver is at the center and the aloha transmission probability is 0.1. Okay, this, this set of uh, results are for, we, we look at how the performance varies as we change the orientation of the main lobe of the receiver. So, basically we put the receiver on the, on the figure on the left, we put the receiver on the center and then for uh, these antenna configuration, that is 16 transmitter and 16 receive antenna, we look at how the performance varies as the receiver antenna is rotated in, I mean, around the 360 degree rotation. 
So as you can see, while at the center, uh, no matter where you point the antenna beam, you are going to same you you are going to see the same kind of performance because there are interferers all around you. So it's not going to vary much. So this is basically the coverage probability, the probability that the received SINR is greater than these thresholds. And when the receiver is at a corner, however, uh, what you see is that, so this corner thing we assumed the receiver is uh, at the south west corner of the rectangle. I mean, from the previous figure. Yeah, the receiver is here. And what you see is that when you sweep across for the first 90 degrees, the performance is poor because you are actually pointing to the interfering crowd. But the moment you point it away from them, like when the uh, beam is pointed for more than, like when the pointing angle is more than 100 degrees, the performance is actually better. So what this means is that if you need to get a good performance, the best thing to do is to go and stand in the corner of the network and then face away from the crowd, basically. So orientation of the receiver is more important in the corner. So in the center, it doesn't vary much. So these are the values that we could compute from the uh, spectral efficiency. So we obtain the average spectral efficiency and then multiply it with the bandwidth to get the um, achievable data rates. And so what we can see is that uh, even with a single transmit and receive antenna system, we could get uh, gigabits per second throughput, even at the center. So center is supposed to be the worst location, but still we're getting uh, gigabits per second data rates. So some concluding remarks. Uh, millimeter wave can provide gig gigabits per second data rates for wearables, so which is important as we saw. Right. The performance is characterized in this work and we see that it varies based on the location and also the direction in which you point your receiver. And the corner users uh, need to point their antenna beams away from the crowd. And the center users suffer from more neighboring, interfer uh, neighboring interference but the, for the using larger antennas basically comes to rescue for the user at the center. If he has a larger antenna, possibly he'll get a better rate. Also, uh, this field offers many interesting uh, features for future work that includes uh, the case when the interferers are uh, at random locations. Here we saw the case when the interferers are fine loca fine, fixed locations. Also, we didn't model the self blockage. So, self blockage happens when, suppose there is an interferer over there, but then uh, he's having a device attached to his, um, say, chest, and but he's facing away from you. Then his own body can block uh, the interference signal from that device. So, that is not modeled in this work. So, that is a possible future work. And also, what happens when the link um, has a 3D orientation? So, we did. So, so we saw a 2D uh, model in this work. Okay, that's it.